In this video, we'll be going over some of the basic characteristics of foraging communities that we see in the world today. Another word for foragers is hunter-gatherers. So we're talking about a group of people who get all of their food from the wild, hunting wild animals and collecting wild plants. Just to orient ourselves a little bit more, uh, the other day in class we started to create this sort of spectrum of complexity and putting certain types of societies that we see in the world today on this spectrum. So we are at the far right. We are industrialists or post-industrialists. And we are the most complex type of society found on the planet. At the other end of the spectrum are our foragers. Okay, foragers live in the least complex type of society on the planet. But it's very important that we remember that this spectrum of increasing complexity does not say anything about uh, value judgments. It's not a matter of better than or worse than. This is simply looking at how complex these societies are. And another word for complexity might be size. In forager groups, uh, people live in very, very small groups, whereas industrialists typically have very large urban centers. Um, so if you compare foragers who live in groups of about 100 or 150 to industrialists like us, we live in a city of 8.5 million people and in a country with more than 300 million people. We are definitely at different ends of this complexity spectrum. Of course, in the middle, we have our non-industrial, non-foragers, who we might also refer to as farmers. And in another video, we'll talk a little bit more about the types of societies that exist within this middle ground. So if we're looking at foragers today, there are a couple of reasons why we find these people interesting to study, why we find them uh, you know, an appropriate uh, place as anthropologists to center a lot of our research. So for one, we study these modern groups because we want to understand the uh, diversity of cultures that exist on the planet today, but we also study modern groups because we believe that they might be able to tell us something about our past. Now it's important that we not look at modern day hunter-gatherers as some sort of living fossils. We don't want to view people who exist in this way today as somehow unchanged over thousands and thousands of years. We know that culture is constantly changing and we know that even in hunter-gatherer groups uh, we know that their, their cultural systems have been continuously adapting over the last 8,000 years, 10,000 years or more. So we're not looking at them as people who are stuck in time, but rather we study these modern day hunter-gatherer groups because we understand that humans solve problems in particular ways. And so if we see how people solve problems today, we might be able to understand how people solved problems in the past. One example of this is a focus in anthropology over the last 50 years of studying people like the Nunamayut or the Inuit, people that used to be referred to as Eskimos. These people live in very cold environments, and they typically hunt very large animals because that's the type of food that's available to them. So we can study the way that they butcher these animals and then compare it to findings from a similar environment. For example, how the Neanderthals were living 50,000 years ago in Europe. The Neanderthals lived in a very cold environment where large animals would have been what was most available to them. So by comparing what the Inuit do today versus what the Neanderthals did in the past, we can better understand the cultural systems of those extinct uh, hominin groups. And this is all based on the law of uniformitarianism. Remember, this is a geological term, the idea that we can understand the past by understanding today. So we look at the patterns that we see in the world today and use that to make inferences about the past. In addressing forager groups, what we're really talking about are subsistence strategies. A subsistence strategy is how a particular group of people supports themselves. And typically this is surrounding the issue of food. Food is central to any biological group. Uh, and as humans, we do food in some very interesting ways. But that does form sort of the center of our societal organization. So we can see subsistence strategies as adaptive strategies, meaning that the ways we get our food are a result of human groups responding to stresses or not responding to stresses. And so we can see similar patterns of food acquisition resulting in different parts of the planet over time, 
um, probably because people were looking to solve the same problems. There are five main types of subsistence that anthropologists typically recognize. The first of these is foraging, which will be discussed in this video, and then the other four fall under the category of cultivation. Uh, one of those forms of cultivation is industrialism, and again, we are an example of an industrial society, but we're not going to talk too much about industrialism. Uh, in another video, we'll talk more, though, about horticulture, agriculture, and pastoralism. Today, hunter-gatherer groups live all over the planet, uh, or I should say, in widely dispersed corners of the planet. So we can find hunter-gatherers in South America, like the Aceh of Paraguay. We can find hunter-gatherers in South Africa, like the San Bushmen, or East Africa, like the Hadza. We have hunter-gatherers in Australia, these Australian Aborigines, of which there are many, many different cultures. And then also people like the Inuit, who live in northern North America, Canada, Alaska, and Greenland. If we look at a map of foragers of the last 100 years or so, we can see that there have been forager communities existing until very recently in many, many parts of the planet. Uh, so here is the location of the Inuit today, the Aceh in South America, the San and the Hadza, Australian Aborigines, and then this other group, the Ainu, who are a very particular case of hunter-gatherers. You'll also notice that throughout North America, for example, there are many, many, many different groups of foragers listed here. And if we were to you know, travel across North America today, we wouldn't find these groups living the traditional year. And they do this essentially because they're following food. Uh, food is something that we have to have on a consistent basis. And so because hunter-gatherers are getting all of their food from the wild, they have to travel to where the food is. Now the type of environment that a group of hunter-gatherers lives in determines what the focus of their uh, food acquisition is. So for example, for groups who are living in very, very cold environments, there are only going to be certain types of foods available. And typically those are very large animals. So hunter-gatherer groups that live in these very cold extremes of the planet are typically large game hunters. By contrast, hunter-gatherers that live in the tropics tend to employ a very wide range of food resources. So there are many lots of different types of animals and plants that these groups will acquire. Historically, hunter-gatherers have not had any need for cultivated foods, meaning that they haven't been pressed to start farming or to start raising animals because the environment provided enough food for them to exist without putting in that extra work. And through a lot of anthropological study, what we've come to realize is that the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is actually less time-consuming and less energy expensive than many other subsistence strategies. So most hunter-gatherers will only spend five or six hours a day doing their sort of food acquisition. Five or six hours a day hunting animals or gathering these foods, which might sound like a lot, but remember that that's basically the only requirement that they have to fulfill within their day. Um, they obviously do fill up their time with many other things, uh, for example, telling stories, creating songs. Um, they're very in tune with the natural environment, uh, but you know they're not going to office jobs for eight hours a day and then also foraging for another five or six. So this is actually a lifestyle that provides everything that people need with less time and energy investment. Foragers travel in groups that we call bands, and these bands are typically about 100 to 150 people. And within a band, most people are related. Now, if you remember from earlier in the semester, we were talking about um, the expansion of the brain in the primate group, and specifically the neocortex. As humans, we have the largest brains and the largest neocortices of all of the primates. And the size of the neocortex relative to the brain, relative to the to the body seems to match up pretty well with group size. So in primates that have smaller neocortices, they live in smaller social groups. According to that data, uh, the anthropologists who did the research projected that based on our neocortex size, humans should live in groups of about 150. And wouldn't you know, this is exactly where forager groups tend to top out at about 150. So it seems like the size of forager groups is uh, in some way constrained or 
um, it's at least aligned to you know our ability to have some sort of social memory. The fact that there are societies now where we live in larger and larger and larger groups doesn't mean that there's any sort of difference in that in that brain size or that brain wiring. It's just that we don't have the same type of social relationships with the people in our groups that foragers have in theirs. A forager living in a group of 150 people will know each of those individuals very well. We, living in a city of 8.5 million people, we don't know every other person in that 8.5 million person group. So our social relationships don't have the same type of intimacy that hunter-gatherer groups will have. Foragers typically see the basic family unit as the nuclear family. And the nuclear family, again, is parents and their children. And they also practice a type of nomadism called fission fusion. And this occurs when hunter-gatherers are moving around their landscape in their larger band structure. But then at some points in the year, there still won't be quite enough food in one place for all 100 or 150 people to get food naturally from the environment, and so they will then split up into nuclear family units, and each nuclear family will go and forage on its own for a time, and then eventually the entire band will come back together and meet up and continue on their nomadic progression. So fission refers to breaking apart, and fusion refers to coming together. Again, this is a way of managing naturally available resources and ensuring that everyone in the group can get enough to eat throughout the year. A person's band affiliation is determined at birth. You are born into a certain band, um, but you can also change your band affiliation throughout your lifetime. So if you are born into a band of hunter-gatherers, it might be the band that your father grew up in, or it might be the band that your mother grew up in. But throughout your lifetime, you can switch bands to your mother's group or your father's group. You can also switch bands after the time of marriage. So if you marry someone from a different band, you could go and live with that band. And they're very fluid sort of band associations. They are based on family, and they are based on marriage patterns. But they're not as strictly patrilocal or matrilocal as we see in some other types of societies. Foragers typically have some very gendered division of labor. And by that I mean that Men have very specific activities that they do, and women have very specific activities that they do. Men typically hunt. They hunt large animals. And women tend to gather uh, vegetable foods and also small animals. Children within forager groups typically stay with women and help them with their gathering. Um, and then when boys start to become old enough, they will go with the men and learn how to do all of those particular man activities. The importance of uh, women's work or men's work in forager societies is largely based on the environment. And so we're going to look at an example in a little bit uh, where we see that the certain activities that men and women do because of what their environment allows has really strong implications for the social status of men and women within the society. But generally speaking, foragers are egalitarian. And egalitarian means that everyone in the group has equal status. Um, so typically with foragers, like with the San Bushmen here, we see that most people in the group share um, the same basic level of social status, although older members of the group will typically have a little bit more social status, uh, and men have slightly more social status as well. Today, hunter-gatherers live in areas where it's basically not possible to farm or to do horticulture. Now, in the past, hunter-gatherers lived everywhere. But as, as our world has gotten smaller through globalization, um, as agriculturalists and uh, ranchers have spread out, needing more and more farmland or more grazing land to meet the needs of their clients, we see that hunter-gatherers have been pushed and pushed and pushed into these very marginal environments. Marginal environments are where it's tougher to meet your uh, it's tougher to meet your daily needs. So foragers are being slowly pushed to sort of these uh, these environments where it's harder for them to live in their traditional lifestyle, uh, and as a result, they aren't always able to get as much food as they would otherwise. So many hunter gatherer groups today are provisioned with food resources by governments or particularly by missionaries. 
uh, or they engage in active trade with farmers. The technological systems of hunter-gatherers are generally pretty simple, meaning that people don't have um, you know, really complex uh, material items that they take with them or that they carry with them. Most hunter-gatherers hunt with bows and arrows that are fairly simple, and we can see that the simplicity is, again, it's not related to someone's ability to do something, but it's more of an adaptation for this nomadic lifestyle. If you're constantly on the move, you don't want to have a lot of stuff sort of dragging you down. You need to be light, you need to keep your material possessions to a minimum to enable that nomadic lifestyle. All right, so until about 15,000 years ago, all humans on the planet were foragers. Absolutely everyone. This is our default setting. Uh, this, is the, this is the strategy that we evolved to have in East Africa when our species was first arising. So being a forager is, um, is what we're built for. As you remember, our species first evolved in East Africa around 200,000 years ago. We then started to spread out throughout the African continent and into uh, Europe and Asia with this Out of Africa II migration, which took place between 60 and 70,000 years ago. Humans get to Europe around 50,000 years ago. These are the sort of cavemen who made these great cave paintings. Uh, these were also the populations that confronted Neanderthals who were already living in Europe. Uh, they outcompeted them, so drove the Neanderthals to extinction. Uh, but also shared their genes with them a bit. Humans get to Australia by 50,000 years ago, probably using simple boats to bump along the southern coastline of Asia. Their technology stays very simple, but those first migrants into Australia were the ancestors of the indigenous groups that we see there today. And we also know that hunter-gatherers made it to North and South America around 15,000 years ago. And they traveled from Siberia and Russia across this land bridge that was exposed during the last glacial maximum, making it into North America um, around 14 or 15,000 years ago, and eventually making their way all the way down here to South America. So that's how we get our hunter-gatherers everywhere. And now I'm just going to go over a few particular groups. Um, so the first group are the San Bushmen, and these are the folks that, you know, if you, if you talk about hunter-gatherers, uh, if you need a picture of a hunter-gatherer, these are the guys who always get sort of trotted out as the example, um, the, the classic case of the hunter-gatherer. So these are nomadic foragers. Men hunt with these small bows and arrows. Women gather plant food and smaller animals. Over time, the San Bushmen have become increasingly sedentary. And sedentary is the opposite of nomadic. Sedentism is when people settle down and live their life in villages. And this is because the territory where the San Bushmen typically have done their um, sort of nomadic foraging, these territories are being cut up and um, made smaller and smaller by, you know, federal governments, uh, by landowners. And so the San Bushmen aren't able to travel around as easily as they had in the past. Because of that, government agencies and also missionaries are setting up stations where San Bushmen can come and get food to help provision them when they are not able to get things naturally from the environment. But we have to remember that nomadism is an adaptation for finding food and for getting regular access to food. So the entire object here is go where the food is. Now, if suddenly there are places set up where people can get food year-round, it makes sense that people are starting to settle down, right? You settle where the food is. So San Bushmen are clustering more and more in these villages because that's where they're able to get uh, the food that they need to survive. The San Bushmen are typically very egalitarian. Um, they have this band affiliation that can change throughout a person's lifetime. They also have what we call a gift economy. So San Bushmen don't use, you know, paper or coin currency. Uh, like we are very used to. They also don't barter, meaning that they don't trade, uh, they don't trade items of equal value. Rather, the San will give each other gifts, and it's not necessary when a gift is given to receive a gift back immediately. However, it is sort of, it's one of those things where it's like in the back of your head, you know that if someone has given you something, 
that eventually you'll have to give them a gift back. So this is a way of not only uh, distributing items around the group, but it's also a way of maintaining social connections. We could not have a gift economy in New York because we're so large that we don't really expect to see the same people often enough to be able to make those connections, to be able to um, you know, make good on our gift-giving obligations. But for the San, because their groups are so small, they're able to give gifts and know when a gift should be given back in return. The Hadza are another African group. Uh, these folks live in East Africa, in Tanzania, and they are really the last full-time foragers in Africa. Um, they get all of their food from the wild, they hunt, they collect berries and tubers, which are sort of like root crops, uh, sort of potatoes. Um, they also collect honey, and honey collecting is an activity that's associated with a lot of status for Hadza men. So the Hadza men, who are the best at collecting money, typically have the highest social status in the group. Honey is something that, uh, that everyone wants as well. So the Hadza will sometimes trade the honey they've collected to farmers or to shepherds uh, to get extra food. So they're definitely incorporated into lifestyles that are not traditionally you know, the, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. The Hadza live in pretty small bands of only about 20 to 30 people, but then these bands will come together during the part of the year where the berries they collect are in season. And it's during these periods of aggregation that we see a lot of religious ceremonies, marriages, um, all of those things that you would expect with community life happen during that berry picking season. They live in a very communal style. And by this I mean that um, they really, they have these cultural systems set up to ensure that everyone has their needs met on a daily basis. So if we think about the hunting activities of men, if four men go out hunting, for example, and one of the men shoots an animal with his arrow, but it doesn't die, it's just wounded a little bit. And then after a little bit more time, another one of the men manages to kill that animal. Technically, that animal carcass belongs to the man who killed it. But he will give a large portion of the carcass to the man who first injured the animal as a sort of thank you for his assistance. And he will give smaller portions of the animal to the other men in his hunting party. Then each of those men will go back to their families and go back to their communities and divide up their portion of that animal carcass to share with their neighbors, to share with their you know, relatives who live nearby. And a simple solution is just for one person to move. So band affiliation is something that is flexible with the Hadza because it's a way that people can you know, move away from their problems. You have a problem with someone in the group, that's fine. You go and you live with your mother's band or your wife's band. Uh, so it's a way of mitigating um, problems by simply removing yourself from the situation. Next we have the Ache, which are a group of hunter-gatherers from South America, from the rainforest. Like our other uh, forager groups, they are nomadic. They get all of their resources from this dense rainforest environment. Men hunt with bows and arrows, and they typically contribute more food to the group. So because of that, we see that men have a little bit higher status than women within the Aceh groups. Women do collect starchy foods, they collect honey, and a lot of the time that people spent in their food acquisition activities is actually to help other people collect food. So again, ensuring that everyone in the group has enough to eat at all times. I think it's something like out of every five days that a person is collecting food in an Aceh group, only one of those days is to collect food for themselves. So ensuring the health and safety of everyone else is a major aspect of Aceh life. The Aceh typically live in groups of about 50 people. Um, although they do get together at certain times of the year, again for religious ceremonies, for um, marriage and such, but they also live in a part of the world that is um, really under threat uh, environmentally and you know, from colonialism. Uh, it's a part of the world where the rainforest is being cut down at an alarming rate to expand farmland, to expand grazing land for cattle. And so for the Aceh who live there, they're being pushed into these increasingly marginal spaces. They're being pushed closer and closer together. So we're seeing that you know, hunter-gatherers typically have a lot of space between them on a landscape, but 
with this encroaching agriculture and ranching uh, lifestyle that we're seeing in the Amazon, these hunter-gatherer groups are being pushed closer and closer together, which is definitely having an effect on their culture um, because it's forcing them to adapt to sharing a smaller space with more people, which doesn't necessarily fit with the traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Next we have the Inuit. Uh, this is a very cool group of hunter-gatherers who live in northern North America, so around Canada, Alaska, Greenland. Because of the very cold environment that the Inuit live in, uh, there aren't many plant foods naturally available. It's an area that is traditionally or typically um, you know, very cold and covered in snow, covered in ice. So we don't see a lot of opportunities for women to contribute to bringing food back to the group. Instead, most of the food is from this large game hunting. Men hunt big marine animals. So, you know, seals, walrus, whales, polar bear occasionally. Um, most of the food that the Inuit eat are from these very large animals. And men, men hunt these using dog sleds and also kayaks. So this is also a group where we see a more elaborated uh, technological system. And men make very elaborate uh, hunting tools like harpoons, which is necessary if you're going to take down these big animals. You don't want to go out on a whale hunt with a teeny tiny little bow and arrow. You want to go with something massive that's going to kill this giant animal as quickly as possible. Because women don't contribute as much to the food of the group, we see that they have a lower status. And that's going to be very important for understanding how environment interacts with gender. So just hang on to that, and we'll come back to it in a second. Our last group of hunter-gatherers that I want to talk about are the Ainu, or the Utari. And these are people who live in northern Japan. They are the indigenous Japanese people. So it, the people who we think of as Japanese today, the, the dominant Japanese culture, are actually immigrants from China who moved into the Japanese islands around two or 3,000 years ago. Now granted, that's a long time, but it is a slightly newer migration. The Ainu, by comparison, have been living in Japan for 15,000 years. So the Ainu were sort of the, you know, the Native Americans of Japan. They were there first, and then this new wave of migrants came in. The Ainu have traditionally been foragers. Um, you know, in their, in their days 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, they were these very typical uh, hunter-gatherers, except that they were sedentary. And this is a big change from the other groups that we've been talking about. All of the other hunter-gatherers we've mentioned have been nomadic, moving around their landscape consistently throughout the year but the Ainu were able to settle down in year-round villages. And the reason they were able to do this was because the environment they were living in was so lush that it provided all of the food they needed without requiring nomadism. So we see that when people have enough food, they do start to settle down in villages. And as people settle down in villages, systems of hierarchy start to emerge. Systems where some people have slightly more social status starts to happen more and more. So these villages of Ainu typically had a chief who was also some sort of religious leader, although because group sizes were still pretty small, um, you know, any sort of judgments, any decisions that needed to be made for the village happened at a village level. Now over the last 400 years, the Ainu have um, increasingly been facing challenges to their traditional lifestyle, and that's because of contact with the dominant Japanese culture. Um, the Ainu were not, uh, not revered for their status as indigenous Japanese people, um, and there was a lot of negative associations with being Ainu for a very, very long time. They were, they were not considered to you know, be important in Japanese society. So the Ainu were not only pushed to the northern parts of Japan, um, but their culture was also you know, sort of stripped from them in many ways. Uh, the Ainu married into dominant Japanese society and in that way started to lose elements of their culture. They started to lose elements of their language. Uh, and they were also forced to assimilate in ways that we can definitely see mirrored here in the United States. With Native American groups, once European uh, colonists came in, 
Native Americans were pushed west and west and west. They were also forced into English language schools, forced to adopt the language and the religion of the colonists, and forced to assimilate to a Euro-American lifestyle. The same thing has happened with the Ainu. But they're still a very cool group of people. Um, the number of Ainu living in Japan today is a bit hard to track because many people do have some Ainu blood. But you can see here in this picture, uh, oops, sorry about that. In this picture, the Ainu, um, they've got a very distinctive look. They look different than dominant Japanese culture. Uh, they look a bit more like Native Americans today, and that's because of the shared East Asian ancestry. And they also, just from their clothes, you can tell they have a really vibrant um, material economy or material uh, culture with beautifully decorated clothing. Um, this woman, you can see she has a tattoo along her lips. And this is something that we can only see when groups start to settle down. In a nomadic group, we wouldn't expect this much elaboration of clothing um, or personal goods. But as soon as people start settling down, they start collecting stuff. All right, so just to, to wrap up here, I want to turn back to this idea of environment and how environment plays a role in uh, social structure. And so we're going to sort of loop back to what we talked about in class earlier with gender. Okay, so most hunter-gatherer groups are egalitarian, or they're often egalitarian, meaning that for the most part everyone has equal status, and there's not a big difference in the social status of men and women. This is certainly true of the San Bushmen, where men and women are both contributing to the food resources of the group. Compare this, though, to the Inuit, who live in northern North America. Because there aren't those vegetable resources or small animal resources in the environment of the Inuit, women don't really have an opportunity to contribute to the food resources of the group. And this very simple fact has led to some really strong gender stratification in Inuit societies. And gender stratification means that one sex or one gender has more power, more economic power, more political power, more social status than the other. And as, as is true pretty much everywhere else in the world, we see that with the Inuit, men have more social status than women. And it's because of this simple fact that men are bringing food home to the group and women are not. So I said at the very beginning of this class that geography is very important. We have to understand something about geography to understand something about culture. And here is a perfect example. Just because of the location of these two groups, northern North America, where it's very, very cold, versus southern Africa, where it's much more tropical, there are many more different types of foods available, that has a direct relationship to the status of genders of people living there. Okay, so based on where you live in the world determines your social status, uh, which is a very important connection to realize. Environment affects culture in really, really profound ways, and we can't remove that from the equation.